It turns out that Hornby is another manufacturer who has been able to pull in one of their flagship products before Christmas. And that flagship product is this, the all new Hornby W1 Hush Hush 10,000 locomotive, which is quite a mouthful. Now, my experience as a customer purchasing this locomotive has not been a good one, unfortunately, this time. And I'm gonna start this video by telling you a bit about that. So I actually ordered my Hush Hush. I pre-ordered it from my retailer of choice on the very day that the Loco was announced. So that was almost two years ago on the 6th of January, 2020. And I thought, great, I've managed to secure one. They're not making all that many. I've got one, can't wait for it to arrive. Now, unfortunately, due to Hornby's new tier system, presumably, my retailer of choice discovered that they would not be getting the hush hushes that they wanted, and therefore my pre-order was cancelled. Now, my pre-order was not cancelled within a few days of me making the order, nor was it cancelled within a matter of weeks or indeed a matter of months. In fact, even a year after I'd placed my pre-order, as far as I knew, my retailer of choice was still able to provide me with a hush hush. My order was not cancelled until 15 months after I placed the pre-order, which is ridiculous. And of course, by that time, all of the other retailers that were stocking this had sold out on pre-orders, at least all of the retailers I checked in at. The only place I could pre-order a Hornby Hush Hush was from Hornby themselves, and I believe that this is exactly as Hornby intended it. At a much higher price, £219.99, and the original price I was going to pay from my retailer was £180, so I've lost £40 before I've even got the thing. Now, I did what I never recommend anybody does. I ordered a Hornby Hush Hush from Hornby.com. Obviously, I did, because I have one right here. To start with, I was not going to do that. I thought, I'm going to stick to my guns. I've recommended that other people don't do this. I'm not going to do it either. But then I got to thinking, you know, this is my job. A lot of people enjoy my reviews. A lot of people use my reviews um, to help them decide whether or not they're actually going to buy a product. If people are having to go direct to Hornby and pay an awful lot of money to get the models they want, if that's the new way we've got to do things these days, then that is all the more reason for me to buy one to find out whether or not these models are actually worth buying. Now, unfortunately, it's taken Hornby a long time to get this to me, which is why this review has taken so long. Usually when I pre-order from a retailer and they take my money, it takes between 24 and 48 hours to get my model. Unfortunately, from Hornby taking my money on the hush hush, it took them 10 days to deliver it. So during that time, I took to the internet, I was looking at social media, I was looking at the forums to try and gauge a sense of uh, how this model is being received by those who have got them. And the results seem to be quite mixed. A lot of people are very happy with their hush hush. They say that it's you know, really nicely detailed, looks great, runs well, very good. A lot of people are also very unhappy with their hush hush. Um, and there are lots of claims of horrific damage, as you can see here, which they claim is due to the poor quality packaging. Now, I have to say to that, I'm not surprised at all because this is how my Hornby hush hush came packaged direct from Hornby flimsy cardboard box which had not been taped together properly and inside there was no packaging of any kind. The loco box was just floating around uncushioned inside there. That is exactly as it came from Hornby. Contrast that with this. This is how one of the retailers that I normally use packages their locos. This was done by Derails Models. Brown paper cushioning the loco from above, the loco box carefully wrapped in bubble wrap and then clamped in that blue foam to protect it. That packaging suggests to me that Derails Models cares about models getting to customers in one piece. This packaging suggests to me that Hornby do not. And this is why we need retailers. And this is one of a million reasons why Hornby cannot replace them, as they seem to think they can. So I'm desperately hoping that this loco is in one piece. And if it isn't, if there's damage, if it's bad quality, it is going back for a refund, not a replacement, because I'm not spending 220 pounds on a loco that's not perfect. But negativity out of the way, I'm gonna go into this with an open mind. Hopefully it will be good, I'm sure it will be. We're gonna find out together. Here we go, the brand new Hornby Hush Hush. All right, let's start taking a look at this then, shall we? So as you can see, this is in the LNER, I think they call it Battleship Grey livery. 
completely unique in my collection. I don't have anything else in this livery, so can't wait to see what that is like. Let me show you the end of the box so you can see the version I have. So the one I've got is R3840. It's an LNER Class W1 Hush Hush 464. Again, unique, unique wheel configuration. And it is number 10,000. And it is DCC ready as well. Now I've not properly looked at this box yet. So let's take a look at the back of the box together. So this was classified as an 8P. So pretty powerful as you'd expect for a local of this size. Here in the middle is a brief, or that, not that brief really, history of the class in real life. So if you want to read that, pause and do so. And then on the other end of the box, you can see we've got Hornby's diagrams. And the draw date for this was 2020. So actually, despite all of the delays and such, they've managed to get this thing into production reasonably quickly, haven't they? Right, well, I'm nervous about this because I've seen the horror stories of these broken locos. Really, really hoping that mine is intact on the front of the loco and also the tender. Please do cross your fingers at home. It won't do any good, but I'll feel better knowing that you're doing it anyway. Okay. It's hard to say without getting it out, but there is the Hornby Hush Hush. A few observations, if I may. First of all, the loco seems to weigh a lot. Hard to gauge these things while still in the packaging, but from what it feels, just holding it, seems really good and heavy, which is great. Second thing, I can see the finish seems to be really good. The photos I've seen have not really told me much about the finish, I suppose, but looking at it in person, so far, it looks really good. Can't wait to get this out and see for myself, uh, without all the packaging in the way. Okay, still feels very heavy, that's great. We'll take a closer look in just a second at what you get in the box. First though, let's take a look at the W1 operating and maintenance instructions. This is for both the original and rebuilt versions of the model, which suggests that the chassis will be the same, if not quite similar between the two. All right, wow, lots of information here. So typical lubrication diagram, traditional points of lubrication, as you can see. Accessories, it does appear that we have a separate set of trailing wheels. I assume some will be flanged. Read it if you want to. We'll just have a look, I think, in a second. Uh, that will allow the Hush Hush to either look more realistic or handle tighter curves, but that's okay. Yeah, fitting of, looks like cylinder drain cocks, buffer beam details, assembly or disassembly, connecting loco to tender body removal, which I will be doing, and also DCC ready slash sound fitting. So that shows you where the socket is. Looks like it's in the tender as usual. And you've also got a bit about close coupling as well there. So yeah, if you want, again, more realistic looking loco at the cost of performance on tight curves, and then you can couple the loco closer together. And then you've got brake rods on the back there. So that's just showing you where those go, but it's pretty much the same on most locos, isn't it? Right. Oh, this is very, very exciting. It's not, oh, it's, it's been ages since I've unboxed a proper hefty big loco. Uh, it's the first one in a, a long time, possibly even years. Right, so here's the accessories bag. And as you can see, the trailing wheels that are included in the accessories bag are the flanged ones. So I assume the ones on the loco will be unflanged. It's going to be interesting to see how that works. Are the trailing wheels fixed in place? Are they on a sort of bogey? Uh, they can't be on a bogey. They can't be if they're unflanged, but we'll see. And then there are some of the other detailing parts. So you've got the brake rods, spare coupling, probably for the front, painted cylinder drain cocks, and the buffer beam detail. So not a huge amount to fit yourself. Um, so most of the details should be on the loco already. Okay, shall we get this out and see then? Please, please be in one piece because I don't really want to have to send this back because I like the locos. Okay. Ooh, my word. All right, this is something quite special. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely something quite special. It's one of those moments when you're looking at something that you have never ever seen before in model form. And not only have I never seen a Hush Hush before, I've never seen anything that looks even remotely similar to the Hush Hush on this channel before. The P2 is the closest thing, and this is nothing like a P2. Right, let's lift this out of its box then. I feel terrified of doing this, by the way, so if you're in the same shoes, do be careful. All right, there it is. I've got to say, actually, the quality feels really good. Part of that is due to the body design. I mean, it's because you've got this rounded section right in the center of the body, which is absolutely perfect for picking up the loco. So that's good. We've got an easy way to handle the thing without destroying it. It feels quality, I have to say. I have read the horror stories of these arriving damaged and in a horrible state. 
Mine seems to be absolutely perfect. And given the terribly lazy packaging that I found by Hush Hush in, I think that is reasonably impressive. The finish looks absolutely stunning. The weight is fantastic. There is no die casting on the bodywork or the running plate that I can tell. It does feel like plastic. Bit questionable, I suppose, for over 200 pounds. But as far as I can see from just a cursory glance at the Loco, no real issues with the quality. So let's have some history on the class in real life, and then we'll take a close look at this Loco and admire some of the finer details. Wow, exciting. Officially known as the LNER Class W1, the Hush Hush locomotive got its nickname because, as an experimental locomotive, it was actually kept a secret during development. A unique locomotive, both in looks and the fact that only one was designed, it was also an experiment in high-pressure steam. The original boiler, before it was rebuilt, being rated for 450 psi, which is significantly higher than other locomotives. The Gresley A1, for instance, had a boiler pressure of only 180 psi, and it was this boiler on the W1 that was partially responsible for the W1's unique looks, as it was constructed in a triangular arrangement in the same style as the Yarrow marine boilers as used by shipbuilders. The remarkably unique status of the Hush Hush goes even further than the unconventional boiler though, because while it was based on Gresley's tried and tested Pacific chassis, an additional set of trailing wheels was added due to the extra length of the loco, making the W1 the only standard gauge 464 locomotive to run on British Railways at the time. Despite all of this though, steaming was relatively poor during tests and it never really met the standards required. As such, no more examples were ever produced and the existing W1 was eventually rebuilt at Doncaster Works in 1936 with a more conventional boiler, only seven years after having been constructed. She was then sadly scrapped in 1959, thus eliminating any remains of Gresley's famous experiment. So there she is up close and personal for you, the brand new Hush Hush from Hornby. And I've got to say, I've looked at this very closely for quite a lot of time, and it is a really, really good looking model. Absolutely fantastic. The finish is far better than anything really that I've seen from Hornby before. The build quality is noticeably improved from previous Hornby Locos this year. The A22, for instance, that's one of them. Yeah, it really is a wonderful looking Loco. Just look at it. You can kind of tell it is just from the uh, wider shots. Now, is it perfect? No. Do I think it's worth £220? No, absolutely not. I mean, I really like chocolate bars, but it doesn't mean that I'm willing to pay a ridiculous amount of money just to get a decent one. But overall, it's a massive step up for Hornby in terms of quality, I think. I know that other people have had quality issues with theirs, but that's not what I've got here. What is here is a very, very high quality model, and I have to review it as such. Why is it not perfect, I hear you ask? Well, let me go over the few slight issues to start with. First one, the trailing wheels. Yeah, absolutely terrible looking out there. They're far from touching the track. Not a good design at all. I know that's a very difficult thing to design. It must have been a challenge, but to me, this is not an adequate solution for a 220 pound model that's supposed to be realistic because that is anything but realistic. And in fact, the front non-driven wheels are not right either because look, if I lift the front bogey wheels off the track, even a millimeter, the drivers come off the track as well, which means there's not adequate movement in the front bogey. It might be okay on straight and level track, it might be on gradients though, that is gonna to start to lift the driving wheels off the track, which is gonna have a detrimental effect on the Loco's traction. There's also considerable tension between the Loco and tender. Look, if I lift up the front of the tender, even just a fraction, the back of the Loco goes up. So how much weight there is actually gonna be on the Loco's driving wheels, I'm not entirely sure. I'll just pause the video there for one second. The tender issue was caused by a bent drawbar, which I discover later on in the video and fix. Okay, carry on. That might be fixable, it might not be, but it's not ideal straight out of the box on a loco of this price. The only other issues I have with this though are reasonably minor and that is the plastic construction. So I think the bulk of the detailing is just plastic, unfortunately. The handrails, they seem and look like just painted plastic to me. The ones on the front are definitely plastic because they're very flexible, as you can see. Got to be very careful with those. And the parts that are supposed to be metal, such as the turning wheels, the pipe work, the various valves, 
and also the whistle, they just have the appearance of painted plastic. They don't look like metal, which is a pity because they don't scream quality the way real metal parts do or parts that have been painted with very high quality metallic paints. And as is so often the case with the cheap plastic running plates, this one, short as it is, is still warped. And I'm at a loss, really, as to why Hornby don't... Do, I, I just assume Hornby are okay with faulty running plates like this because time and time again, I've showed Locos with cheap plastic running plates. I say it every time, it ought to be metal. We've paid this much money, it ought to be metal. It very rarely is from Hornby still. And uh, yeah, here is the result. Warped. And it's noticeably warped, and you can just see it worse when I put the ruler there. So that is why it ought to be metal. No excuses at all. Although this is the only area of the model that has been majorly affected by the cheap plastic construction. The quality of the Loco, besides the points I've mentioned, is very high indeed. Let's take a look at the finish. Look at the bodywork here. This is what you call a quality finish. It's not plasticky like so many Hornby Locos are. It has a very elegant satin sheen, which is not over the top, and it's not at the point where it's overly glossy and toy-like. That is, I would say, spot on, just as you'd want it. And the decoration is very good as well. As you can see, all of the lining on the boiler, while not dreadfully complex, it's all perfectly accurate, which is great. You've got the high quality, very high quality printing on the side of the cab, the running number there. A lot of numbers to cram on there. I can definitely imagine in real life there being a few hairy minutes when whoever was charged with painting this thing realized that they had to fit five numbers on a regular sized cab. But no, it works and it looks great in model form as well. You've got small prints such as the LNER builder's plate. I'll get a close up on that for you. Small separately painted details such as the steps and also the fronts of the cylinders as well, which are picked out in the silver. This running plate area, by the way, is all made of plastic, as are the steps. And as a result, they're not quite as sturdy as you might want them to be. It seems a little bit dodgy having such a, a flimsy component right next to all of the valve gear and such. Of course, it will be absolutely fine as long as you don't catch it, but you have to make sure that you don't. And then on the front buffer beam, you've got the running number, which is nicely painted in the white. And while we're here, we might as well take a look at some of the other details. There is the screw link coupling holder on the front, but the model did not come with screw link couplings. That is a thing with this model. It doesn't have lots of bells and whistles. I don't think it's got any lights, no clever DCC fitting system, and uh, certainly no extras like the screw link couplings. No room really for missing features at this price point, but no very major complaints. The buffers, as you can see, are made of metal and they are sprung. There you go, that's nice. And one pretty cool inclusion, in my opinion, is the lamps. Yep, yeah, we do have lamps factory fitted to the model, not included in the detail bag, so that's nice. Let's take a better look at this end though, because there's an awful lot going on. So you've got the separately fitted handrails all over the place. You've got them on the sort of smoke deflectors, for want of a better term, on the front of the smoke box. But this is really what you would, I suppose, call the smoke box cover. But if you look underneath the cover, which you can, you can see the real smoke box has been detailed underneath there. That's a wonderful little bit of detail, isn't it? Really, really great. And then around that area, there is an awful lot of detail around the running plate, lots of different mechanical components, pipe work, very, very intricate and also very extensive. That stretches way down back behind the outer body shell. It's quite impressive. Across the top of the boiler is this join line. Now, this is how a join line looks when it's supposed to be there, right? It's not mismatched, it's not wonky, it's not more noticeable in some areas than others. Yeah, it's clearly deliberate. That is not what you call a molding line that is unintentional. I think that's quite important to draw attention to because a lot of the time I will point out a really messy join on the top of a loco where you can see the two parts have been messily sandwiched together. And people say, no, oh, no, it's meant to be like that. No, it isn't. This is how it looks if it's meant to be like that. As always from Hornby, the wheel set and the valve gear, coupling rods, etc., are all very, very high quality. So you've got the plastic wheels with the metal tires on the outside. To me, not a problem. That looks absolutely fine as long as it works. Not only are the axles out of sight, but the center of the wheels are all fully molded too, which is a wonderful effect, far more realistic than a lot of other manufacturers. And in fact, I would say the front bogey wheels are the best. Marvelous looking wheels. Very, very convincing, I think. And yeah, all of the rods, the valve gear, you name it, very fine. Quite fragile, don't get me wrong, but very realistic looking to my eyes. 
Let's take a look then at another of the model's most impressive areas, and that is the cab area. Now, to my mind, there's something wrong with the front of the cab here, because you've got the glazed windows, and then the glazing sort of carries on across the whole front. Now, the pictures I've seen of the real Hush Hush did not look like that where the cab is concerned, although it's quite hard to see. So if anyone's got a better photo that sort of shows the cabs looking a mess like that, uh, do let me know. But I'm going to guess that that is a manufacturing issue and not intentional, but I'm happy to stand corrected on that if more evidence comes to light. On top of the cab, you have the opening air intakes, which are very, very small and fiddly, but they do actually open and close. So that's a nice mark of realism. I suppose that you could call that a bell and a whistle, or both, I don't know. I did say this model doesn't have many of those, but it has that, so it's got that going for it. It is the cab interior, though, that is the most impressive part of this. Oh, blimey, look at that. Now, that is an exquisite cab. This is the cab of a locomotive that cost £220. That I'm quite happy to admit. Yeah, it doesn't really need explaining, does it? I'll just show you the shots and you can take it in. There's a lot of detail here. <laughs> there you go. That's my uh, completely redundant comment on the cab. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you've got the cab doors pre-fitted as well, and also the metal tender fore plate, which is pivotable and poseable, so you can move it if you want to. Yes, yeah, a very, very good cab. I suppose the only thing it's missing is the firebox flickering effects. It's nice to have. It's a frivolous, pointless feature, but nice on models that cost an awful lot of money. Yeah, look at that. I do love that the gauges have been fully picked out as well. So you can honestly say that there has been no expense spared on the cab at all. Very good indeed. Okay, let's move on and take a look at the tender then, which is complete with a similarly good finish. I was wondering whether the Hush Hush was going to just use an existing Hornby LNER tender. Uh, I don't think it does. I don't think it does. This looks new to me. Could just be the livery that's different, but I'm pretty sure not. The finish is excellent, just like the Loco. It seems that when Hornby said that they'd delayed these Locos deliberately to improve the fits of the components and the finish and such, it seems that wasn't a marketing lie or anything. It really does show in the final product, and I think Hornby should be proud of themselves for actually going the extra mile to deliver a high-quality product. I genuinely think it was worth it and that they were right to do that and that it paid off. So, uh, yeah, a thumbs up for that. Let's have that again, please. Yeah, great decoration. As you can see, LNER lettering looks absolutely fantastic. Don't think I've ever seen it in white before, and that's quite a, a nice new experience. Underframe detail looking pretty good. You've got a lot of good moulding going on down there. You can clearly see all of the axle boxes and the springs and the surrounding components. Brake rigging pre-fitted, nice metal realistic looking wheels. It's easily just as good, if not slightly better, than the Hornby A4 tender, I'm going to say. The A4 tender is probably one of the most detailed ones I can remember seeing. That sticks in my mind. But yeah, look at all of these tiny little components on the cab end of the tender. Loads of controls, lots of moulded detail, looks wonderful. You've got the coal load, which is separately fitted and very fine. You've got the corridor connector, which you can see going through the left-hand side of the tender, if you look at it from the front. And then the corridor connector on the back, which looks good. Although the connector itself is not rubberized or anything, although I don't see any reason why you'd want it to be. Lots of handrails around the back of the tender too. More sprung buffers. Yeah, it's a nice feature. I do like sprung buffers. Yeah, I mean, what you're going to do, string me up? I like sprung buffers. I like what I like. And then you've got the little porthole. Not a great piece, really, that. Not moulded particularly well, but it's okay. I'm glad that it's there. And then you've got the separately fitted lamp brackets on the back, which are not just a part of the moulding, so that's reasonably impressive. Lots and lots of detail on the tender. I'm 100% convinced. And all of this comes in at 462 grams, so it's, you know, it's the best part of 500 grams. That's heavy for a loco like this. It's more than the Hornby A2 slash 2, so that's pretty good. I thought those locos were reasonably heavy, but it's still less than the Hornby Railroad A4, which I thought you might find amusing. So it's not, you know, ridiculously heavy or anything, but it's more than adequate. I would say the biggest issue is going to be those front bogey wheels and whether or not they're going to cause trouble for me on gradients. Well, we're going to find out because I'm going to investigate the mechanism, then we'll get this down onto the track and see how it performs for the first time. Very exciting. Here we go, Hornby Hush Hush performance. So there is the beautiful Hornby Hush Hush down onto the track ready for the first test. And talk about finish, look at this shot for instance. Look at the shine on that boiler and tell me that is not a quality loco. 
Very, very good indeed. And so is the mechanism, very high quality mechanism. In fact, I also identified, well, a fault, you could say, uh, and I fixed it so that the Loco is now far better balanced. It was a very, very simple fix, but you wouldn't realize that there was an issue unless you disassembled the thing. Basically, when I took the tender off, I noticed that the Loco to tender drawbar was bent, and that is why the tender was taking some of the Loco's weight and tipping the Loco forwards very slightly. So now, I can lift the tender off the track, as, as you're supposed to be able to, without any of the Loco's wheels coming up off the track. So if your Loco isn't pulling properly and it's cutting out and stuff, check the drawbar. I didn't bend the drawbar, I lifted Loco and tender out with two hands, I was very careful. Must have happened at the factory. Let's talk about the mechanism then. So the base keeper plate is removable with just three screws and serviceability and accessibility absolutely perfect because the base keeper plate is not hardwired although it was completely covered in lubricant though, so over lubricated, unfortunately. The Loco wheel set has a proper set of bearings, as you can see, very high quality, would expect nothing less from Hornby. Now you've got just one driven axle that's in the center, there's a good place for it. And as you can see, you've also got those spring loaded contacts for the base keeper plate as well, so all good there. I really like the chassis overall. It's very simple, which I like. It's not in any way over-engineered, but it also has no bells and whistles, no lights, no special features, nothing like that. It does, however, have the usual Hornby five-pole motor, or what looks like Hornby's usual five-pole motor, with this gigantic flywheel. It looks like the same flywheel, actually, as was in the Merchant Navy, so that's really, really good. I like the flywheel. There is, however, no capacitor across the motor contacts, which is a bit of a concern. There's the drawbar and the loco to tender electrical connection. It's quite a dated design now, unfortunately. Other manufacturers have done far better than this. And actually, a system like Dapples for their D-Class and their Mogul, where coupling and uncoupling the loco and tender is very, very easy, would eradicate any issues with the drawbar becoming bent. So I think that's definitely something for Hornby to do. The gauging is quite interesting as well because all of the non-driven wheels uh, were gauged normally at 14.4, 14.5 thereabouts, but the drivers were under gauged at 14.3 or 14.2 and they were all under gauged. So I'm guessing that that was intentional to allow this thing to handle curves and such. And as you can see, look at the amount of swing on there. Yeah, I mean, it's not a huge deal. Generally, undergaged locos don't slow down on curves and such, but you've got to watch it on the points. So we'll see how it goes. The loco also has tons of pickups. You've got all the loco driving wheels picking up and all the tender wheels picking up as well. So you've got seven pickups to each track, which is fantastic. I think though, that is everything covered on mechanism. It's a good quality mechanism overall. I've got high hopes of this loco working well, particularly now that I've solved the issue with the tender. Right, yeah, I can't believe that amount of play. I suppose that shows you why flanged wheels on those uh, trailing axles would uh, not be a good idea. Okay, the moment of truth has arrived. Does this loco work? I sure hope so. I think it will. It seems quality. Here we go. Okay, well, it doesn't sound very good, but that was its first ever movement and it hasn't yet been allowed to run in. And I will do that before I draw any conclusions. Hmm, a bit of a growl to it. Oh, and I did see something happen there. What was that? I don't think the camera would have caught that. But I'm sure I saw it wheel slip. Let's see if we can see if I can do that again. I think it was on the points. Yeah, there it is. So it seems with the drawbar fixed, there's still a bit of an issue with balance. Let's see. Is it the driving wheels taking the weight? See right there. Now this is just a slightly uneven bit of track. It's not even an incline or anything. Let's have that again. Let's have it approach, for which there isn't enough torque. So I'm turning it up. There you go. Oof. Is it me, or is it not the smoothest runner in the world? <laughs> oh, we need a miracle if running in is going to fix that. 
Yeah, I, I don't understand that at all because everything looked tickety boo inside there. Everything's swimming in oil. I didn't notice whether the motor was swimming in oil or not, so maybe that's dry, I don't know. But I'm not that keen on putting oil on a new motor because it should have had some already and if you over oil a motor, it can really mess it up. Well, that looks all right on this bit of track. Let's just see what the crawl is like then. Yeah, let's give that a go. Yeah, there's control there. Look at that. It's cogging horribly, um, which makes me wonder whether, you know, is, is it a high quality motor? Although it is a massive, massive flywheel, so there is quite a bit of resistance from that at the motor level. Try reverse. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's not run in, and that's pretty darn good. Yeah. So if it gets a bit smoother with running in, I think we ought to have a decent crawler. The big flywheel should have a, an effect at the higher speed, although it's, it doesn't have the same effect that the Merchant Navy does. You know the Merchant Navy, it will keep running for a, a foot, a foot and a half, 30 centimetres if you want it in uh, metric. Yeah, this seems to stop faster than that, so is it the motor? Is something just not as free as it ought to be? That seems to stop a lot faster than the Merchant Navy does. And yet everything does seem nice and free. So I think the best solution is just gonna be run it in and hopefully things will be better and I won't have to try and find out what's causing the oddness. So let's hit it with 50% speed and let's, uh, let's observe it around the track, shall we? Oh, just ground to a halt, I've noticed on a bit of perfectly straight track. Hmm. Oh no, that is not good. No, I can hear it vibrating. Got to pull that off. I can feel it vibrating. Got to take that off the track. No, can't keep running that, unfortunately. Uh, there's a major source of friction. It looks to be this front set of drivers. Uh, something very wrong. It looks like this rod looks a bit bent, but I don't see how it can be because everything's lined up. Uh, there's loads of play in this connecting rod on this side but not that much on the other side. I, I don't know, it's a really weird one. I'm gonna have to remove the base keeper plate again and reinvestigate. It feels like there might be some bit of shrapnel or something, uh, you know, just some debris uh, in the way of the bearings. It feels like there's some sand in there or something. Really, really tight. So I've got to look into it. Can't keep running through it, unfortunately, because it's stalling the motor at 50% speed. You can't do that kind of stuff and get away with it. So I'm going to have to investigate. I'll be back in just a second. Fingers crossed. What is it with this issue this year? It's happening all the time. Well, as soon as I, this screw, this screw at the front of the base keeper plate, second I start, even a quarter turn, as soon as I loosen that screw, this front axle free as a bird yet again. Look, I can even turn it. It's beautifully, beautifully free soon as I put the base keeper plate on, so it's not done the motor in, that's the first observation. Second, let me retighten these screws now, see what happens. I haven't done this already, so this will be the first thing. And the front screw. Yeah, still seems okay. Yeah, okay. Is that free again? That seems free again. So was something trapped under the base keeper? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything to get trapped there. I think they are all good and tight now though. Yeah, it just feels different now. It feels much freer. Uh, all the bearings were in place. Yeah, there was nothing like that. It's weird. Fine. Right, well, let's try again. Let's see if the horrible noise has gone now. Oh, there we go. Stopped again. I'm going to have to go and rescue it very, very quickly. Yeah, so it ran freely again for about a quarter of a lap, and then it locked up and stalled itself again at 50% speed. So there's something crazy going on. Let's go and see if that front axle is binding up again. Yeah, it's not, it's not good enough, really. You should be able to just pop a model on the tracks and have it work. It's a model for capes. No, it's a model for repairs immediately out the box. 
yeah. Let's get some power to it like that. We flip it round. Oof. Sounds, oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So it's stored there. So, is it valve gear? This should all be locked up if it's the valve gear. No, they're all free. It's this axle. Look, that axle is stuck fast. We push it towards you. There you go, it's free. Ooh. See that? Yeah, that is really binding there. Poor. Loosen this off a bit. Oh, it's still doing it. Yeah, we're going to have to investigate this properly. Right, I'll be back. So I've looked very, very closely at the bearings and the axle. There's nothing on them. I've cleaned them. They all seem nice and smooth. Uh, I've re-lubricated it and I've reapplied the screws just very, very loosely. And, ooh, does it seem all right? I thought it had another little funny moment there. It does seem to occasionally slow down. All right, back to the track. The fun is starting to wear off a little bit. I know the real thing was a bit unreliable, but I'm pretty sure the thing didn't break down every 10 seconds. It's not great, this. Let's see what happens. Right, this curve's where it got to last time. Oh, is it gonna complete a lap? Oh, can hardly stand it. Come on, you can do it, one lap. That's all I'll need. Okay. Well, it doesn't sound ever so good, but it's handling curves now. And I don't know, it is at least at a stage now where I can run it in. It should be possible to run it in. Something seems to go out of alignment in that front axle and then the whole thing just stalls. And that's not right, that's not good because that's putting a lot of pressure and a lot of force on those very thin coupling rods. And in fact, they're looking a little bit bent. So if the issue isn't solved, I've got to solve it soon before they shear through. <laughs> it's going again. <sighs> yeah. I don't know, folks, I really don't. Well, before I send this back to Hornby in a coffin shaped box, I'm just going to try and straighten out that coupling rod, just on the off chance that that is the cause and not the effect. I didn't notice any coupling rods bent before I started to run it, so I'm pretty sure that's not it, but that's the only thing that I can see that isn't 100% right with it, so I'll try everything before I send it back as a fail. And unfortunately, folks, I'm not buying another one of these. I want my money back at this point. Yeah, well, I've straightened it out. I'm pretty sure if it's just going to happen again. But the thought of this thing just running perfectly is too tantalising not to try anything. So we'll try. OK. Another test. And on we go. Uh, still doesn't sound good. Yeah, well, it doesn't sound at all healthy, but it's not stopping anymore. It's done a good few laps now, so if I can finish the review, then that will be something I highly... Oh, no, 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 here we go. Stopped already. I'm going to say, I highly doubt we'll get to 30 minutes. Right, this is poo now. I should not be doing this, but I don't want to let it beat me. So I'm just thinking that maybe the gauge was to blame. So I'm going to re-gauge it to 14.5 as it should have been in the first place. And we'll see if that improves. Right, that's the front axle re-gauged and re-quartered. So I'm laughing because I can't believe I've just done that to a new loco. Uh, for now, it seems to be okay, but that's happened many times. The fault seems to come back at random points when I'm not looking. 
So yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever. We'll keep trying. I mean, I can't keep trying this forever, but uh, I've got a bit of time, so we'll keep going with it and we'll see what happens. But I'm not gonna take you along for any more of this. So I'll see you at the end of running in or when I've finally reached the end of my tether, whichever comes first. Okay, folks, so the stalling issue just kept coming back. It kept coming back. I think I'd fixed the problem. It had run perfectly for sometimes minutes, and then the problem would come back, and I'd turn around, and it stalled somewhere. So I don't think I've solved the problem, but what I did instead was popped it onto the rolling road, where it did also continue to stall. But I found that if I hit it with 70% speed, <laughs> this is not what you should do, by the way, um, then it would go and I could leave it and it would not keep stalling. And uh, I did that and it didn't sound very good after its first half an hour. Listen to this. But I've now been running it back on the main layout again uh, for, it's probably been going for a good 15 minutes or so and it has not stalled again. It's not running perfectly or anything, it's not super smooth and I've worked on it for hours to get it to the, this stage so if you run into the stalling issue I don't think you're just going to be able to run the thing in and, and it will fix it. I suppose it's worth a try of course as long as you don't burn the motor out but I think we're able to at least continue with the review uh, although I do still think I'm going to be sending this back because I'm never going to be satisfied knowing that it's got a serious mechanical issue. Uh, but the pulling power I have been able to test, it comes in at 0.35 newtons, which is around 22 coaches on straight and level track. That is less than a Hornby Railroad A4 uh, by quite a long way, by a huge amount. Uh, it's about the same as the Dapol Prairie, so I don't think that is quite right. Again, I don't think all of the weight that should be on the driving wheels is on the driving wheels. I think these front bogey wheels are too eager to take the weight, as you can see. And it seems as though Hornby have tried to combat this because there's loads of weight in this area of the body, in the front here. Um, but of course that is not going to help at all if the weight is not going onto the driving wheels. Uh, so if I was keeping this, I would now look to the front bogey. And if you decide that you're keeping your hush hush and you've, you've got one of course, uh, then I would look to the front bogey, see if you can take out a spacer, see if you can cut the spring down a little bit. Uh, but because I might be sending it back, I'm not willing to mess about with it. So let's see what the crawl is like now. I did try this briefly and found that it wasn't as good as it used to be. Let's see if that's accurate. Right. Well, it just sort of accelerated without me touching the controller, so let's do it again. Try and crawl. So I, at this point, don't know whether the motor has sustained damage or not due to its stalling because it was a better crawl than this before, but obviously since then it's, it's stalled like 12 times or something. And um, not for long each time, but it's not good for a motor to stall. And so I don't know whether or not it's sustained any damage. Um, having said that, it's probably not far off the crawl it did before. It's a bit coggy, it's not very smooth, and it does seem to, there we go, I didn't turn it up then. <laughs> Oh, you can't see my hand on the controller, so I, hang on, let's do it again so I can prove it. Okay, so if I get this to crawl, and then I'll let go of the controller, so we can get it at a sensible crawl. How's that? Yeah, I'll let go then, <laughs> see what it does, see if it does that again. Yeah, it's not what you'd call consistent. I reckon it'll go any, any minute now. Oh, wait for it. Hey, here we go, speeding up, and slowing down again. Oh, I'm speeding up again. Yeah, and every motion is jerky. Let's try a little bit faster. Oh, here we go. So now, that's okay. But as you all have seen, the, uh, the response in terms of the speed. Oh, let's slow down again. Yeah, it, oh, and... Oh yeah, you've still got that issue. So there's your evidence of the front bogey issue. So what I think is happening here is the rear wheels are sitting on the track now and so are the front ones and the drivers have all but lifted off. Yeah. It's just, I don't, there's just something not right about this. I, I don't want to just point the finger at Hornby's design team or whatever, I know I normally do. 
trying to be nice. I'm trying not to be anti-Hornby all the time because I know I've been hard on them this year, but I, I really don't know what I can say to let them off the hook with this. It's just really not at all acceptable. See if it'll fix it, there we go. <laughs> So even though the pulling power is not astonishingly good or anything, uh, it is at least enough for the Hush Hush to haul a decent-ish number of coaches. So I've got seven here, and I think that will be okay. Well, assuming the driving wheels stay on the track, I think that will be okay. So let's give that a go, 40% speed. And we'll verify that it can haul those up Gordon's Hill. Right, so I think 40% looks about right. That's about the speed I normally run things at. So we'll leave it at that. On the middle line, I'm running the P2 for you. This is the Hornby Railroad P2. Although it's had a few upgrades. I've popped, a, I've got a new motor in there, a better quality one. <laughs> and it's actually a really good runner now. There you go, with some X LNER Teaks. And then we've got one of Hornby's great little A4s. Uh, it's the Railways Mallard, this one, with some Pullmans on the inside line. So let's catch up with the Hush Hush. I have to say it's nice to see the thing actually making it around the track now, uh, but I don't think this is something that I can enjoy knowing that there's a, a mechanical issue with it. So enjoy it while it's here. <laughs> let's see how it takes the layout. So I would say, aside from the unhealthy noise that it's making, I would say that it's now running acceptably. And if it, have, if it had have run like this straight out of the box, um, then I think I'd be keeping it because it seems okay. I really, um, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Actually, every five minutes I change my mind. One minute I'm keeping it, the next minute I'm sending it back. What do you lot think I should do? What's the right thing to do? Please talk some sense into me, whatever that might be. I can't send it back right now because I've got the C word. So I'm going to have to wait until my isolation period is up before I can go to the post office or anything. So yeah, please do let me know what you think I should do. I, I, I really cannot say what the matter is with it. I don't know at all. Uh, it could be a mixture of the things I've identified. It could have just had a knock in transit, but then it should have had some packaging around it. You know, a little bit of bubble wrap is not a lot to ask for on a 220 quid locomotive. Based on what I've observed from the way the loco performs when it's not having its funny turn, and based on what I've seen from the mechanism, they are good, they're good quality locos, and I think they have the potential to be good quality runners. It does at least hold the track well, it doesn't slow down noticeably or derail on curves and points, so if you're looking for good things to say about this performance-wise, then that's a couple for you right there. I can't recommend them as good quality runners, because a, mine isn't a good quality runner, and B, I don't know what's causing its problems. It's really hard to draw a conclusion. Um, I don't have the luxury of ordering another and trying another because I'm not having another 200 odd quid go out of my bank account, and I think they're out of stock now. Well, they're out of stock at Hornby. Whether retailers have got them in, I'm not sure. I saw some pop into the model center. They had quite a few in stock at some point, although I think they're gone now. Yeah, I just, I feel like I've done, I'm done with the big search to try and find a hush hush. That's what I've been doing for the last nearly two years. And I'm, I'm sick and tired of that. So yeah, I'm not breaking my back to get another one. I've given this the fair chance. In fact, I've given it more than a fair chance because I shouldn't be trying to troubleshoot and fix a loco. I should be reviewing it exactly as it is out of the box. This loco has had the luxury of a little bit of a troubleshoot because I couldn't run it out of the box. If I just let it sit there and burn its motor out, then I would destroy the loco and I wouldn't be able to carry on with the review. So I've had to do what I've done. I've tried to be as fair as possible. I think I have been and the loco isn't right, unfortunately. Let's have some ratings then for Hornby's latest Hush Hush. Well, they're ratings to the best of my ability anyway, based on what I've got here. Level of detail then, definitely five star for me. Can't really fault the level of detail. The decoration, perfect 
far as I can tell. That includes the finish as well. Amazing work from Hornby. Level of detail, fantastic as well. Wonderful cab, quite a few nice features, such as the visible smoke box door underneath the cover. That's really great. Uh, I think it's just the cab. It really is the cab that wins me over on this, but the level of detail elsewhere on the model uh, matches the cab as well. So yeah, level of detail, fantastic. Performance, I'm gonna go straight out there and say you cannot rely on my two star performance rating here because when it first came out of the box, mine was a one star because it was just totally jamming itself up and stopping. Now it's perhaps running a little bit more like a three star, but I'm still conscious that the issue's there and it's lost its ability to crawl for some reason. There are hush hushes out there that are fine. I mean, I've been reading the forums and stuff. Some of them run absolutely fine. Maybe they're four star, maybe they're five star. I really don't know. Uh, but mine, I'm gonna give it two star. It's running at a three now. It was a one out of the box, so I'm gonna split the difference. But do bear in mind, for my example, I had to do a lot of work to get mine to run like this. What I would say is if you've got one of these or if you're thinking of getting one, test it very carefully, watch it like a hawk before you decide whether or not you're keeping the model. Any problems at all, you need to get it returned as soon as possible. Pulling power then, again, this is not very trustworthy. I've got 0.35 newtons, which is 22 coaches. Again, though, I'm pretty sure that's because the front bogey is taking a lot of the weight off the driving wheels. Is that a manufacturing tolerance issue that's affecting mine and others, but not all of them? You, again, that could be accurate, it could not be, but mine, I can say accurately, has a pulling force of 0.35 newtons, and that's quite a lot less than the A4 from Hornby, and it's about the same as the Dapo Large Prairie. So it's okay for a decent rake of coaches, uh, it's not a problem at all, but it's not quite as much as you'd expect for a loco of this weight. Mechanism then, in theory at least, is very, very good. On paper, in my opinion, it's a five-star mechanism. You've got lots of pickups, you've got proper bearings on the wheel set, five-pole motor, chunky flywheel. It's simple, but it gets the job done, so it's a five-star on the mechanism, except for the design of the front bogey, which has not been designed properly, in my opinion. It doesn't have enough vertical movement in it, causing the driving wheels to be lifted off the track, unless the rails are perfectly flat. But the quality, unfortunately, is not great. It's really disappointing and deceptive because when it first came out of the box, I thought here is a great quality model. And to a degree, yes, it is a quality model. I mean, the finish, like I say, is quality. It's been put together in a very, very competent way. No glue visible, really. Very, very nicely assembled, but you've got the plastic construction, which leaves parts of the model flimsy and other parts, such as the running plate, warped. And then, of course, you've got whatever quality problem it is, that's stopping mine from running properly. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Is it gauging? Is it quartering? Is there something wrong with the chassis? Is there something wrong with the bearings or the axle that's causing friction? Is there too much play? Uh, this is, there's all sorts of stuff it could be. I really don't know, but there's something that is preventing this loco from running correctly. So two star on quality, unfortunately. And then finally, value for money for £219.99. I don't think you get what you pay for here, not really. I suppose if the performance was perfect, then it would be a slightly higher score. But to get five star, this really just had to be a more reasonably priced locomotive. Either that or it should have had a few more extra features. So lights would have been great. A pre-fitted speaker would have been really, really good. A little bit more metal work, metal whistle, a few of the metal details that look good. Definitely the metal running plate though to stop all the warping. And obviously it needs to run correctly as well in order to be considered a good value purchase. Yeah, unfortunately 220 quid, it's just not representative of this model in my opinion. The whole thing has been a faff. I mean, I've had orders canceled, I've struggled to find one, I've had to pay the highest price out there. And now that I've got one, it's just been a massive faff. Quality issues with it, I've, had, I've spent half the day trying to figure out what the matter is with the thing. I still don't really know. Yeah, it's a bit disappointing, unfortunately. Overall then, that is a very disappointing score of 6.08 out of 10. Into the logbook it goes then, 43rd place down there with the Backman 9F, which ironically enough was another hideously expensive model with some very poor quality. All right, well, there it is. That is an accurate review of my Hush Hush. If you've got one as well, look, fingers crossed. I hope yours is better. I do know that some better ones are out there, uh, but unfortunately, I and a lot of other people, it seems as well, uh, have not been able to get one. But no, I think a refund is the way to go, unfortunately. It's a lovely loco and I would love to own one and maybe I'll buy another one at a different time. 
But yeah, it's a waste. It, it's not a sensible way to spend 220 quid, unfortunately. But your mileage may well vary. So there you go then, folks. That is my review of the Hornby Hush Hush. Beautiful model, absolutely beautiful. And if you've got one, if it came from, if you managed to get one for a good price at the retailer and it looks good, it's all in one piece and it runs well, then treasure it because you're lucky to have one that is in good shape. Uh, I wish I did. I wish I did because instead it's probably going to be going back. Like I say, not 100% made up my mind yet, but I think that's what I will do when I'm uh, recovered and I can go outside again. I think I'll, I think I'll be taking it back to the post office. Um, but if you don't think I should do that, also please do let me know. But that's it. That's my review. Let me know what your experiences are if you're lucky enough to have a Hush Hush. Uh, was yours okay? Does it run well? What's the performance like on a good runner? I'd be interested to know. I think it would be good, but I'd, I have no way of proving that with mine. Okay, folks, thank you very, very much for watching. Have a great Christmas. I know we've still got more videos and stuff to come, but yeah, hope you're having a, a nice holiday. Uh, I'm going to try and not let this thing ruin mine. I certainly won't, don't worry. And I'll see you soon. All right, thank you for watching, folks. Catch you on the next one. It isn't throw away, it's for keeps. No, it isn't. It's going back because it keeps breaking down. Mm -hmm.